I'm Jack Helmley. I was asked to give a brief reflection on Jesus' words, I thirst, spoken in suffering on the cross. I thirst. What does this bring to your mind? Well, certainly Jesus' physical suffering, his thirst for water. In the Gospels, Jesus refers to thirst several times. At the well, woman, give me a drink. In the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst in righteousness. In the temple, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And of course, on the cross. Already, in just these few passages, we are beginning to see not only our thirst for the love of God, but his thirst for our love. Let us picture for a moment Jesus having traveled all morning. He's tired and in need of water, and there, the woman at the well. Now in this scene, who is thirsty? Well, Jesus is thirsty, of course, but we come to see how thirsty the woman is, and not just for water, but the deep thirst to be loved and forgiven, and to accept the living water, to accept Jesus as the Christ. Jesus asks for a drink because he is thirsty, and then satisfies the thirst in the woman by revealing his very real message of salvation. I thirst. In 2016, Pope Francis offered a beautiful meditation on these words. What does the Lord thirst for? Certainly for water, that element essential for life, but above all, for love, that element no less essential for living. He thirsts to give us the living waters of his love, but also to receive our love. Pope Francis spoke of a grieving St. Francis of Assisi who used the term, love is not loved, to describe our Lord's unrequited love for us. Man's response to God's thirst for, our, for love is often vinegar, a symbol of rejection. From Psalm 69, for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. And of course, this scene is repeated in Jesus' suffering on the cross. Pope Francis reminds us that in the thirsty poor, those suffering among us, they are so often given vinegar instead, rejection of their worldly needs of comfort, food, and peace in their lives. Far too often these poor souls encounter the deafening silence of indifference. Mother Teresa often said that we satiate Christ's thirst for love in him by loving our neighbor. So much has been written about Mother Teresa's devotion to the thirst of Jesus. You may be aware that in every chapel in the missionaries of the poor, on the wall right next to the crucifix are the stark words, I thirst. Mother Teresa said that those words in the chapel were the constant reminder of the purpose of the missionaries of charity. She said, the general end of the missionaries of charity is to satiate the thirst of Jesus Christ on the cross for love and souls. But to Mother Teresa, these words, I thirst, were so very personal. She asked each of her sisters to imagine Jesus saying these words, I thirst, to them. Jesus calls to me, Jack, I thirst. Now, put your name in his call. Hear Jesus calling you saying these parting words from the cross, I thirst. Thank you. Please join me in sharing a reflection about the second of Jesus' last seven words, as recounted in Luke chapter 23. Have you ever been really down on your luck? I mean, facing an impossible situation. All the more difficult if that impossible situation you're facing is the result of your own bad choices or your own bad decisions. That would certainly make it all the more regrettable. If you can identify, raise your hand. And if you haven't raised your hand, then maybe you're not being honest with yourself because we've all been there, we've all made mistakes. The question is, what do you do next? This was the situation faced by two thieves that were being crucified alongside Jesus Christ on a very gloomy Friday afternoon some 2,000 years ago. The one thief on his left actually looked at Jesus with disdain, disdain and said, aren't you the Christ? If you're God, save yourself. And by the way, save us too. That man had had a hard life and made some very bad decisions and he was about ready to have 
a very hard ending to his life. The actions of the second thief were quite the opposite. He rebuked the first thief and said, aren't you afraid of God? Then he looked at Jesus and said, this man has done nothing wrong. He's a good man. Clearly he knew something about the Christ and he knew about the teachings that he had heard. He declared Jesus a good man who was being punished unjustly. The second thief, though, is oftentimes called the good thief. Well, that's sort of a strange description for a thief. Why? Not because of what he had did, but because of what he did next. You see, the second thief then reached out to God and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus responded, not just to the man's words, but Jesus saw his heart. He saw a heart that was humble and honest and contrite. And without hesitation, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Imagine how that second thief, the good thief felt when he heard these words. This man went from a terrible death and no hope to hope and an eternal bliss. This is exactly how we should feel when we come to Christ ourselves. When we come to him in humility and honesty and contriteness. But even think for a moment more about exactly what Jesus' words were. Today you will be with me in paradise. We know that in Genesis, Adam and Eve were with God in paradise. They had that sort of bliss and that peace until they decided that they knew better, that they could go their own path. And they disobeyed the one command that God had given them. Don't eat from that tree. And then they sinned. They separated themselves from God. We have an opportunity, thanks be to God, that we can be joined and secure our place in paradise with Christ. If only we come to him in honesty, humility, and contriteness. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Thanks be to God. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Burke, and Father Jack has asked me to spend just a couple of minutes uh, uh, with all of you uh, to talk about uh, Jesus' last words on the cross, specific to St. John's Gospel, which, of course, um, was um, his last words, uh, according to St. John. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. And, uh, you know, just a few, in just a few words, I think there's a lot that we can, we can learn, um, you know, particularly during this Holy Week, this Holy Week perhaps in particular because of everything that is going on uh, around us in 2020. Uh, and the challenges that we face. So um, I think um, if you recall, St. John ends his gospel by saying, and I'm paraphrasing heavily, if, if we wrote down everything that Jesus did, uh, it, the whole world wouldn't be able to uh, uh, hold the volume of books that would be written. So um, you have, I, I've always looked at the gospels as uh, you know, somewhat of a highlight reel, uh, if you will, filled with messages. And I think uh, the message that Jesus is giving us uh, through the message that he gave to Mary uh, as he was expiring, I think is particularly impactful. And I think we can learn a lot from um, that moment in time, but I also think we can learn a lot about uh, Jesus' relationship with Mary and the importance that she would have, uh, obviously, in, in his uh, birth and upbringing, in his ministry, uh, and ultimately in uh, her role as caretaker. Uh, and mother of the church. So I, I think it's probably worth uh, spending some time on and um, you know I'm, um, uh, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to be with you to talk about it. I, th I think Mary is really the most amazing human being ever born, right? Uh, I think that from, the, from her upbringing to the Annunciation where she made a critical choice uh, for all of our benefit 
you know, to her role in the wedding at Cana in terms of, uh, you know, effectively pushing Jesus into his ministry a little early, as only a mother can do, um, to, uh, you know, her role uh, in his ministry and ultimately in her role as the mother of the church. I think it's just, it's an incredible story. But what strikes me about those last few words is that Jesus, in fact, uh, had thought of everything. Um, we tend to think of, you know, the last thing that we say or the gun lap and, you know, being the most important. And I think it reveals uh, your beliefs. I think it reveals your priorities. And I think in Jesus' last words uh, to Mary and to St. John, uh, he was uh, amidst torture on a physical level, on an emotional level, on a moral level, where he's taking on uh, the world's sins, completely abandoned by everybody but uh, a couple of bystanders, including uh, Mary and John, uh, is is really, really telling. He had uh, a very special relationship with her, and therefore she has a very special relationship with him, and I think it's something we have to be mindful of. Um, Bishop Barron, uh, in a recent uh, communication, um, uh, highlighted uh, that when we say the rosary, we actually ask Mary to intercede on our behalf uh, you know, 50 plus times, 50, 50, uh, 53 times, I guess. Um, and uh, the rosary obviously is very, very powerful. And I think sometimes we go through it just quickly and without thinking about uh, what we're actually asking of Mary and without perhaps thinking about how deep our relationship uh, with her actually is. Most of us have been saying the Hail Mary for our entire lives. Uh, you know, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. 50 times. Um, she clearly has uh, something to tell us, and she clearly has offered uh, in many, many ways to intercede on our behalf uh, to her son. We clearly know that in these last words from Jesus that he was uh, making sure that his mother was taken care of, that the most important person in his life, uh, you know, until such time as they were reunited, would, would be cared for. And that's just a beautiful thing. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. So I invite you. Uh, to spend some time thinking about uh, your relationship with Mary, uh, her relationship with Jesus and the apostles, and just what an incredible human being she was. She must, by definition, be the most amazing human being uh, ever to have uh, walked the earth um, as uh, purely as a human being. <laughs> Obviously, she'll take, sec she'll take second place, but uh, she was truly inspirational, and I think she has a lot to tell us today, and I think she has a lot to tell us this week. And I hope you spend some time, uh, you know, reading some of the scriptures and thinking about it and thinking about uh, the last words of Jesus and perhaps thinking about your relationship with your own uh, mother. Uh, and, uh, you know, be she here or uh, if she has already, um, you know, passed on uh, and just just how wonderful that is. Uh, so I, I hope everybody has a great uh, uh, Holy Week and wraps up uh, a wonderful Lent. Uh, you have our best wishes from the Burke family uh, for your health and your safety and your happiness. Uh, and we look forward to talking to you again and seeing all of you again when things perhaps are just a little bit uh, more normal. Take care. Hi, my name is Kevin Fitzgerald. My wife Alice and I are mission companions with the Youth Apostles Institute, and it's my honor today to give uh, my reflection on the fourth sequence of words that Jesus utters uh, as he li lies dying on the cross. And those words are, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Very powerful words, and they evoke two things in me, um, both emotionally and spiritually. The first is just the fact that Jesus is worrying about everybody else. <laughs> he's worrying about the people that have crucified him. He's worried about Pontius Pilate. He's worried about um, all of the people in Jerusalem that were either, either believed him or didn't believe him. He's worried about humanity, and he's asking for the Father to forgive humanity. He's not asking the Father to come down and intercede and straighten things out. He's not asking for something for himself. It's the greatest unselfish act in the history of, of the world. And it brings into the world the word empathy. 
and it brings into the world emotional intelligence and the progeny associated with that. Uh, and the reason I, I want to spend a second on that is it's, it's the hallmarks for business and leadership uh, around the world now, whether or not someone has empathy and emotional intelligence. And in fact, uh, there are traits that we raised our children's, uh, children through in, in terms of the Catholic Christian faith. And uh, we're very proud of the fact that our colleagues and friends have, have commented us recently that, that both our sons um, exhibit uh, empathy and emotional and intelligence. And that, that really makes us feel wonderful. The second thing that really hits me here is, um, and which is a hallmark for our church, is forgiveness. And the forgiveness uh, that, that is being asked for of the Father, of all the people who've crucified and spat on Jesus, and all the people in the world um, who need to be forgiven. Um, and it's, it's such an important trait uh, for our, or more for our religion, um, for two reasons. One, we need to forgive other people, um, and that's what Jesus is 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 showing us in that moment um, but more importantly we need to be able to seek forgiveness from God and uh, his act of seeking forgiveness for God for us to me uh, is is you know the whole hallmark of confession for the Catholic Church um, so as Jesus lay dying he does not think about himself he worries about everybody else and asks that God help everybody else, number one. And number two, he asks that God forgive us after we as a people, as a, as a world, crucify the Son of God. And every time I read that, I get very emotional. I cannot believe that we as a world did that. But here he is asking for forgiveness. So today... As, as we shelter at home, I would challenge you all to think about those two items, but particularly forgiveness, because when we come out on the other side of this, there's been going to be a lot of questions, uh, a lot of finger pointing. Or will you be able to forgive those who didn't do what you thought was the right way to handle this crisis? Have a great Easter. Stay involved with Youth Apostles. It's a great organization. Jesus, we look at you hanging on the cross, betrayed by Judas, denied by Peter, beaten, crowned with thorns, mocked. All your disciples have run away. Only Mary and John stand at the foot of the cross. You knew the road to Calvary lay ahead of you, but your love for us, your desire to reunite us and save us, to restore us to the fullness of God's image and likeness, you wanted above all to do your Father's will. This was his will, to restore us to the fullness of his infinite love. You always knew that your disciples, that we, could never grasp the depth of your love in mere words. You called them to witness to your teachings, and this would mean you had to give the supreme example of the true meaning of love for another, giving of oneself no matter the cost. Now in your humanity, you were weak, from carrying the cross in dreadful pain nailed to it. You were tired and no one could ease that pain or take it away. But then this is why you had come, for only God could make up to God for the dreadful sin of Adam and Eve. And only a human being could offer a sacrifice in the name of all human life, seeking forgiveness and reconciliation. We cannot fathom the tremendous physical pain you endured. Wasn't that enough? But death entered the world through Adam's sin, and you knew the only way to overcome it was to endure that human death and overcome its lasting effects by rising to new life. Yet it was not just the human torture, but as you hung from the cross, you felt so alone. Where was your father? He had asked you to do this, and as an obedient son, 
you had said yes, for you shared in that love for us. In your humanness, you felt such discouragement, emptiness, and deep loneliness. I know these words and what they mean. I have seen them in the face of a child, an aging parent, a lonely or ill person, the one who mourns. I myself have felt these feelings of being forgotten, left alone, feeling at times that no one cared. For me, they were almost unbearable. I hear your voice cry out, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? I realize that in my emptiness, I glimpse at just a small portion of how you must have felt. I feel a tiny bit of your loss, your sense of abandonment. I can only take so much, but you are God, perfect in every way, most sensitive, caring, and loving. For those brief moments, you willingly and lovingly took on all our pain and loss and abandonment. You who are one with the Father in heaven, united in eternal love, felt the most unfathomable separation from his love. In your humanity, you cried out, for you could not bear to be separated from his love. And yet it was your great love for him and for us that moved you to experience willingly what it would be like to be separated from his love. Sin separates us from God's love. Only by experiencing what that ultimate loss of God's love would be like for us could you show us the depth of your love for us, the eternal greatness of God's love for us. Just as you called out for your Father, you remind us that we are never alone because you are with us even though we do not always recognize your presence. You experienced that feeling of seemingly losing God's love so that you could restore us to the harmony that unites us with his love. God, we ask for the grace today to comprehend in faith the love Jesus has for us that led him to the cross. It is finished, John 19.30. It is finished as Jesus' recognition that his task is completed and that his suffering is over. The work his father had sent him to do has been fulfilled. But where did it start? Father Jack gave a very inspiring series last year uh, entitled The Old Testament Pointing to Jesus. Indeed, uh, it's littered with, with evidence all over that that everything is, is leading to Jesus. Indeed, the, the word became flesh. Just two weeks ago, John 8, 51 through 59, Jesus, when talking to the naysayers, said, Abraham, your father, rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. I say to you, before Abraham came, I am. There you have it, start to finish. Um, I want to get to that, uh, expound on that more on the commitment, but wanted to say um, what a difference a year makes. Certainly we're under a lot of uncertainty and we're not, we're way far from the norm. I'm sitting on my front doorstep in the middle of Holy Week. Normally I'd be trudging up Connecticut Avenue with the throngs of faithful filing into beautiful St. Matthews. Every Ash Wednesday and Holy Thursday, the communion song is always Ubi Caritas. If you don't know it, Ubi caritas, es vera, es vera, Deus ibi est, Deus ibi est. Where there is true charity, God is present. You may be thinking Pete has gone off his rocker, but no, I'm talking about this in St. Matthew's just because I wanted to lead into commitment. If you look at St. Matthew's, it was founded in 1895, and it took over 30 years to complete. Well, those were people who spiritually were very committed in every sense of the word to get a task done. So what are we doing in our lives? Is there something that we can become 
singularly focused on to achieve and have a, and be able to say it's finished. Um, just think in your life of when you've done that. You know, I can think of one of the obvious, you know, as a school kid, you wanted to graduate from high school and then with the eye of going to college and graduating from college. And I was able to achieve that focus. It's a, it's a worthy, uh, worthy goal and a worthy worldly accomplishment. But what can we do spiritually with the same focus and the same vigor um, that we did to achieve those goals? I think we, we don't need to beat ourselves up, but how do we get there? And I think we need to listen to God. What is God calling us to do? If our goal is to, when we leave this earth, to hear those great words, well done, good and faithful servant, come and share your master's happiness. If that's our goal, how do we get there? We don't want to be like the rich man who used to step over Lazarus every day, only to find out when they both died that he's in the netherworld looking across the great chasm, um, it's too late. So I say, look to the word, look to scripture. One of my favorite passages is, my sheep hear my voice, says the Lord. I know them and they follow me. When Jesus was performing his miracles and his good works, it was always about faith. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. The two blind men that were eagerly wanting to, Jesus to, to, to heal them. He asked them, do you believe that I can do this? Yes, Lord, they said to him. Then he touched their eyes and said, let it be done according to your faith. Can we take what Jesus did for us and make the most of it? I think so. The words that a person speaks right before death have special significance. Indeed, even criminals about to be executed are invited, do you have any last words? Many of us have probably gone over and over again in our mind the last words spoken by a loved one. Not surprisingly, the Gospels record Jesus' final words Luke's account of the Passion draws our attention to a very telling detail. Despite hanging on the cross for three hours and now choking from asphyxiation, we hear that Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus wanted to assure all that even in the throes of agony, he was dying as he had lived. He remained in intimate relationship with the Father. Consider the scene of Jesus' death. He is crushed by unimaginable agony in body and soul. He grieves as he sees the mourning of his loving mother. He is reviled and taunted by all. Indeed, he is hated despite his generous works. Even his apostles, his closest friends, have run away. Our Lord has now given up everything, even his clothes. Only one thing remains for him to give up. He now hands back his spirit, his very life source to the Father. To those witnessing Jesus' horrifying death, all that he had stood for and his message of hope must now have seemed empty. Indeed, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus gives voice to the depth of his torment. He cries out, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Matthew was likely writing for a Jewish community that would have understood both the clear words of this statement and also its reference to Psalm 22, a hope-filled and joyful hymn. Luke, on the other hand, was writing for a Gentile audience, not likely familiar with Psalm 22. He cites a different utterance from the dying Jesus. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. That Luke saw this statement as exemplar of those who would follow Jesus is suggested in the Acts of the Apostles. We hear Stephen, the first martyr, 
saying precisely the same words as he lay dying. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Jesus is repeating the opening line of Psalm 31. He was no doubt deeply familiar with this psalm, since devout Jews often included it in their night prayers. Psalm 31 praises the abiding confidence in God, despite the evils that surround one. As throughout his entire life, even now at the point of seeming defeat and degradation, Jesus is immersed in complete trust for his Father. Evil has not won out. Jesus literally has the last word. His whole life witnessed loving reliance on the Father. In Luke's Gospel, Jesus is in constant prayerful communion with his Father. Sometimes he spent the whole night in prayer. He had come into the world to save us as sinners. He performed no miracles for himself, but only for others. His life made concrete the depth of love that the Father has for us. Jesus has come from the Father, has been totally faithful and loving and serving the Father, and now he returns to the Father. Indeed, Jesus never really left the Father and always maintained fidelity with him. He will next appear to his disciples and to us in the triumph of the resurrection, assuring them that he is to ascend to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. What about us today? We're now struggling against this invisible, deadly coronavirus. Despite our accustomed sense of self-confidence in life, we may now feel ourselves helpless in the battle. We may realize that much in life is outside of our control. We, too, are suffering this Good Friday. During this crisis, as we also focus especially on Jesus' suffering and death, do we follow his model of total trust and partnership with God? How important will our experience of this cataclysmic event be and our meditating on Jesus' suffering, courage, and life? And how will this make our lives different? Despite our fears and uncertainties, this Good Friday offers us an incredible challenge to grow in love for the Lord and in our reliance on the Father. We ought not waste this opportunity. Jesus will have the last word.